Okay, so welcome to podcast number four of the Slack Chat podcast, which is uh, with me, Stuart Winter, and Phil. Hello, Phil. Hello, Stuart. Thank you. I'm waving at you, but you don't. I don't. We're not doing video, so you can't see me. But oh. I am actually waving. Virtual wave is good. It's good. Virtual yeah. Waving. So this is a continuation of episode three, in which we started making inroads into what, really what are the dynamics of the open source community with regards to how do people work together and how do they think about um, the kind of work they put out there and how do they think about. Um, the way that they interact with the community. And we started just talking about that. We left it, I think, in the previous podcast with how much time that uh, you and I were dedicating to uh-huh. projects. And so I thought I'd start talking about it by discussing Knight Rider. I thought that was a good place to start. Do you remember Knight Rider? Talking car that drove through walls and drove itself and things. Yes, of course. Kit. Kit, yeah, Knight Rider. Yeah. Yeah. So you might wonder what the hell has got to do with anything. But... There is, a, there is a lesson that I, le- I learned from this early on. So b- back in mm-hmm. when I had my um, Acorn A3010, which is like a ARM V2 thing, I bought a digitizer for it to digitize stills off, you know, to grab frames from, you know, video, VHS in my case. And so one of the things that I liked doing was just getting particular stills of the car crashing through walls or whatever I just happened to like at the time. And, um, and it was a bit of effort to do that. You know, you had to disassemble my parents' like VHS set up and right. put it in a different room. And, but I did that. I uploaded the images onto a website. Oh. And I just put them there because I wanted to. I was just making a website, as people did. And that, I, you know, I uploaded new ones every now and then, maybe a couple of times, a couple of weeks or whatever I did. Anyway, one day, uh, I don't know why, but I'd stopped doing it for a while. Maybe, maybe my parents didn't like me disassembling everything. And then I got an email from somebody that I'd never heard of saying, essentially, the message was, you stopped uploading new Knight Rider images. Will you be putting more back? And please, when you put more back, can you um, put more to compensate for the time that you haven't put any? (laughs) Right. And (laughs) I must have been like 16 at the time. And I read that and I thought, who are you? What on earth are you asking me? Who on earth do you think you are asking me for these things? And, you know, there's one thing they could have said, oh, I really like your Night Rider images. Are you putting any more up? I hope you put I hope you put some more up soon. I love them or something like that. But the way that it was written was kind of like a demand, like some sort of sense of entitlement that, um, you know, here was someone just doing it for their for that particular person's yeah. own need. You know? And I was thinking, what on earth? So, so I got that. I mean, there are different ways you can respond to that, right? It could have been that the way that they just write it culturally is that way, or it could. But that's one of the issues, isn't it, with with um, text-based communication? Even if there's, even if there are smileys, that doesn't necessarily mean much. But then, fast forward a number of years, when I was at, when I was working at Red Hat, and I went to, I don't know what it was. There was a bit of software, and I think it was to do with recording music or some something like that uh, that I, I was doing. And there was some kind of bug in it or some, so I contacted, I wanted to contact the developer to ask whether they could fix it. And so I looked at the, the you know, the documents for it and found out who the developer was. And I thought to myself, hmm, that name looks familiar. It's, uh, it was Olivier Fordan. So I looked up and lo and behold, it was familiar because Olivier worked in the same Red Hat office as I did on the, on no, the floor below. No way. What a, what a coincidence. Yeah, of all the places that yeah. he could have been, right? So Olivier Fordan is the, the the maintainer and developer of XFCE. Uh-huh. I don't know if he still does maintain it, but he at least did it then. So I thought, like, oh, cool. Well, that's, that's easy. I'll just go and speak to him then. So I went down and said hello and yeah. introduced myself and those things. And and, and I said, oh, you know, there's um there's a bug in, in this thing. And he said very nicely, he goes, oh, oh, you can send me a patch. And it's a little bit embarrassing to say it, but I thought... I was a little bit miffed. I was a little bit out because I thought, well, I had this strange entitlement mentality at that time, even though I'd been working with open source for a bit. I hadn't really put much out at that time, I don't think. And I thought, well, hold on to myself. I didn't say this, obviously. (laughs) And he said it very nicely. He wasn't like telling me to, you know, go off. He wasn't doing that at all. But I had this thought in my mind that, well, if you put it out there, you should fix it. Right. Like, you know. Like you should, because it doesn't work how I want it to. And then 
you know, skip ahead many, 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 many years, mm-hmm. I kind of like find myself in exactly the same position thinking, well, yeah, you can send a patch if you want. It's cool for me. And so I, I was, I know that we've talked a little bit about this. Um, it just came up one time, didn't it, on uh, IRC a long time ago. And we've talked to this. So what, what, what are your kind of thoughts? What have you seen? What do you think about how, how these things work? I'm, I'm interested in in which occasion you're referring to when, when you say it popped up on, on IRC. Hmm. Right. I'll give you a bit more context then, yeah, because yeah. it was a while ago. The way that I'm thinking of it is that there are at least two dimensions of working with, of what goes on with open source. If you, even if you take away the open source element of it in the sense that the, the source code is free, Mm-hmm. You know, we could just say it's public domain where there's no source code. It's just a binary and have, you know, go use it. Yeah. You know, even if we take that, the fact, the, the dimension of the fact the source code is available, whether you can do anything with it is a different matter, even irrespective of licensing. You know, if you take all of that away, there's still the fact that somebody has put something out there and you can use it or not use it. You know, they've if, it's, if they're not charging for it, which it, usually open source isn't, then... They've just, it's somebody who's written it because they wanted to. They've made a tool yeah. and they've chosen to put it out there. Mm-hmm. But there is no, they're under no obligation whatsoever to listen to what the, what the users of it say, yeah. Yeah. to fix any bugs whatsoever, to, to even put any updates out. There is, to do anything else. There's zero obligation. Yet some of the, the conversation that, that I was referring to, that, that we'd been discussing, um, some comments and things that we think we'd read at the time and we could both come to that conclusion actually which is why i started with the night rider yeah. thing is this sort of there seems to sometimes be with a small with a i should i guess a small number of people that there is some kind of you, you the way that the way that they write things it does come across that there is some sort of sense of entitlement that hey you put this thing here and i'm using it so you must fix it because i'm using it and i'm important yeah, yeah. This, and and that that was Kind of one of the things I was, um, one of the things that we both noticed uh, independently, and we just ended up talking about it. Okay, my my attitude towards that is different than it was. I have to say that because over the years I've um, I've grown in knowledge and experience with with Slackware mm. to the point where, if for example I said to you, your your compile is not working properly. And you, if you turned around to me and said, well, fix it then, I'd, I would. But that's me now. Given, given say, eight years ago, if there was a problem with Slackware Arm, I would expect you to fix it. And that's because, as you rightly said, you're the one building it and, and maintaining it. So in, in that respect from from the end user you you do have a certain responsibility to ensure that the software you've put out works so if right. there are any problems in it i my my opinion is that you should fix it but if that's in any way linked to any third party development program software that they're dealing with then that brings a whole new angle to the problem and and it's whether well it, it, it's it's whether it's going to benefit the community if, by you getting involved or whether it's just a, a single piece of software that needs fixing for mm. for their benefit but i i think for the for the software that you're releasing that that should work as it's designed to work you have a certain responsibility to ensure that that's happening Right. Yeah. So you, yeah, you've touched on the other thing I, I was thinking of as well there. So there, there are a few things in that that you just said. And so, for example, if I take the first thing, is that you're right. <laughs> I probably would have said, uh, yeah, just go fix it. Maybe not. <laughs> it depends on mood I was in. Well, I, I was. But I was, yeah, no, well, you probably. I've been a bit flippant, Stuart. Sorry. Well, no, no, I probably actually have said that. <laughs> Because <laughs> you know, but that's a really good point. Let's let's re- let's give this a bit more of a frame. I can kind of remember some of the things you would have brought to me, and most of the time, 
Let's, let's make a few distinctions. Years ago, one of the things I used to do is I used to in, upload into the saw, into the Slack where I'm the tree, the directory the directory structure. It used to have all the build logs. And one of the things that one of the guys years ago called he was uh, his nickname was Orlan, and I, uh, I don't know if he's still around. And he was on the one of the Slackware IRC channels that I used to frequent. And he, amongst other things, I actually posted him an alpha to Germany. <laughs> Because we got an old Alpha at Red Hat and they just didn't need them anymore and I wasn't going to use And he was maintaining the, he sort of, sort of taken, um, I've forgotten his name now, the the one who's the, one of the Slackware alumni on the website, is it Chris Lumens, I think his name is. Right. Yeah. And he'd taken, I think he'd taken his work and just carried on with an Alpha port of Slackware. So I said, oh, I've got this Alpha, do you want it? So I posted it to him in Germany. And one of the things that he looked at when he looked at the ARM port, he looked at some of the build logs and said, you've got a bug in this package, look. <laughs> and I hadn't noticed it because I hadn't got some of the error, some of the, the checks in the build script were, were, were missing. Yeah. And so he's like, yes, it's broken. I thought, oh, thanks. So I just rebuilt it and fixed it yeah. because it was broken. So if someone comes and says, you know, what you've done is supposed to be like this, it's supposed Slackware works like this and yours doesn't, but, oh, unless there's a really good reason for it, then yeah, I'll go and fix it because it's supposed to be that way. So that's a different conversation to where you're, right. uh, where you're coming in saying, I'm taking your work and making it work on something that you're not, that in your case, it's the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. I'm doing this thing here and your work, what you've done doesn't work on there. Well, that's kind of your problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. if, I, if I wanted it to work on that, I would have done it myself. Yeah. So there's, there's those distinctions to make. So I'm, I'm, I'm under no obligation to fix it. It doesn't mean I won't help you. Obviously, I have <laughs> helped you with various things. But there's no, there's no obligation to, for me to do that because I'm not aiming to, for it to be that way. Whereas if the, the tool chain was broken and I found I could replicate it on mine, oh, yeah, I really need to fix that. Now, but that brings us on to another, the, the other dimension. You know how all of the all of the devices are called Pi. So you've got like vendor X Y Z, and they bring out Mama Pi, they yeah. bring out Bad Boy Pi, and everything yeah. is Pi. And what they do is is to one of the things about the ARM architecture is that, uh, and this is one of the reasons why years ago people used to ask me this question. So I put it as an FAQ. They were like, well, why is it that Slackware ARM doesn't support Blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, and I've told you a number of times, whenever I look at a machine, there's a number of things that it has to have yes. in order for me to accept it as a good idea, yes. which is like real-time clock, although I'm kind of losing the, <laughs> the battle on that one. Things like eSATA, USB, uh, network, uh, hopefully video, but that's not essential. But those three th oh, and the other thing is it has to be, it has to have U-boot, basically, because right. anything else, I know how U-boot works and it's yeah. the industry standard, so anything else can kind of go away. But that's, that's, so that's kind of like the hardware and some of the initial supporting frameworks around it. Then the next thing is, is that I know that the kernel, I need to know that it is supported upstream. In the case of the OpenRD board, which is a uh, thing, there was really nice hardware at the time. It was like, yeah. it had like everything, like a bazillion expansion ports. The case was even like moderately cool. <laughs> for right. a I was like, oh, this is really cool. So I went, okay, well, it's a Kirkwood system. So it's basically a Shiva plug, which is really popular. It's far more popular than the Raspberry Pi was. Uh -huh. That was the predecessor for the Raspberry yeah. Pi. And so the, the hardware was basically supported, but not entirely. There was no kernel support because it still had to have a slightly different kernel or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I contacted the company that made it and said, well, are you going to actually push this stuff upstream because I've tested it. It seems to, I was actually in a mood for testing it and it seems to be fine. Can you just commit it? Because it, it, the audio is not there and the blah isn't there, but it doesn't really, the video is not there. It doesn't really matter right now because everything else, the base like network, ethernet, uh, it boots, and it's, it's there. And so they actually, they got it merged upstream. So at that point I could say, right now, okay, even if they never put the audio in, I don't really care because I want a build machine that's better than the previous one. So I was able to go and bring in support for the OpenRD client just because they got it committed upstream. So that meant that, you know, instead of having a patch, a fork of the kernel or a ton of patches, because what's going to happen after a while, the patches are just going to get bit rot. They would just not apply yeah. after a certain point in time. It's always the case because the kernel code changes too much. So I've got all these parameters that have to be 
that has to exist has to be satisfied before I'll take it on board. So that's one of the reasons why. So you've got the fact of like as you said before, you've got to maintain that project. I can't mm-hmm. put something out in in there and say, oh yeah. So the other people, for example, might go and buy an Open RD client, which happened actually was pretty expensive. It's not like it wasn't thirty quid. It was I think it was over a hundred at least. Which I mean that's quite a bit of money to shell out on some arm thing, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not gonna. I don't want to go and put that out there and go oh I'm supporting it and people buy it and then go oh go well I had to cut it out now because you know they didn't put it upstream that's quite irresponsible of a thing to do mm-hmm. in addition to that w- one of the things that again that goes with the maintenance and that kind of thing is is the use of someone else's brand so in in our case or in my case I'm using the slackware brand with Patrick's permission so I'm aware that anything I do is actually done under Patrick's brand. It's not mine. So I'm quite careful about what goes out in terms of the style, the appearance, the quality, the fact that I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about, uh, as you said before, like when I do this thing, well, I need to maintain it. Mm-hmm. I enjoy thinking about how to maintain it for the future and that kind of thing. Patrick does that as well. So you have to, you have to be cognizant of that and build, you know, as you said, you have to when you're working on that project, you have to think about all these things so that when you do put things out there, they they are sustainable. Mm-hmm. And and in terms of style, in terms of appearance, and, and and that's why you know, which is why I'm happy that you and I have been talking about these things because you've got a lot of the uh, we said before a lot of the users for Slackware Arm come from Sarpy. The Sarpy installer, yeah. Exactly. So from, from the Sarpy installer, so and and a lot of the the people that use it, so that we both know, we've we've seen, is that they think they're installing a distribution called Sarpy, but it's actually not. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there's nothing you and I can do. I know you've you've told me you've you haven't you put things on the website and stuff yeah. to try and you tried to cajole people uh, into a into really knowing what they're doing, but you know you, people don't read. Some people do, but many um, don't. Yeah, it's not as bad as it used to be. I think the message is getting across, but um, I am quite sure I'm. Uh, I know which conversation you're talking about now. Is right. this the conversation we had about the H3, where you broke my heart and told <laughs> me that don't don't hold your breath for it for upstream support because it may never happen. Is that the conversation you're referring to? The, the, it was the H3 sock on the orange pie that we were discussing. And, it, and I, um, I came to you and said, look, this doesn't have support upstream. How, how do I get it supported upstream? <laughs> and, um, and you said, look, I've had ARM devices that I've been waiting for official support for for years and it's never happened. So don't hold your breath. Um, and I was quite forlorn. I thought, oh my God, this is such a such a neat little device. Of course, they've got to support it. I had the attitude of the end user that you're referring right. to, thinking they must support this device. But you're quite right. Whether it's supported or not is is beyond my uh, well, it's, it's outside of my jurisdiction. That's for sure. Exactly. You've got yeah. no influence, so you have to. Uh, you know, you have to, as I said before, you have to go and find out what the current situation is. And, you know, actually, yes, it was the H3. So actually, yeah. it's quite interesting. There's a few things around that. So you brought my attention to an image that the, I don't know what the name of the company was in the end, but they'd made a, the vendor, so, so go back to what I said before. Right? So let's say you've got vendor XYZ and they're mm-hmm. making mom a pie. Yeah. It's a brand new device. It's amazing. It's arm and sexy and the website looks great. And They've got on there, you know, they've got images for Raspbian, maybe Debian, Fedora, Arch, and then Slackware. And you could say that that's a really good thing, and I think that it is. And when, you, when you're when you on the other side of it, like in my case, and you, you told me about this, this image and you were kind of a bit uh, taken aback mm-hmm. <laughs> about exactly how it was presented. Yeah. So I had a look at it. and. Really, what they're doing is they 
in, in this particular case, you know, they'd, I, I unpacked the image and I had a look at it to see what you were going on about. And they kind of just hacked a load of stuff in there and just jammed in like some yeah. firmware in places. They hacked up some, well, the kernel was a different matter because it wasn't mainline. So that was that was already there. Mm-hmm. Um, they'd done the various other bits and basically jammed together an image that you could put on an SD card or something yeah. and get Slackware on there. Now, the thing about... Hmm? Slackware, you have to be careful when you use the word Slackware with that image, because yes, it says it's Slackware, and in certain respects, it works like Slackware, but there's no Slackware behind it. The, like as you say, it's been it's been put together using using various different elements of of other operating systems, and yeah. For me, that is not Slackware. That is really as far away from Slackware as I want to be. So, yes, in that respect, I think you should be careful when you're using the word Slackware in conjunction with it. Exactly. So so in the case of the H3, uh, the Orange Pi, which the H3 is the, the all-winner um, yeah. system on chip, they'd done that, and, of course, they do that, and they'd done it with all the other distributions as well, and they'd said it's the Slackware on here, but they hadn't asked me about it. But that's fine. Um, well, kind of. <laughs> but um, the, they, they've done that in an effort to say, OK, th- you know, this device, you can buy it and you can put these distributions on it. So it gives the consumer confidence that they can just use it. But the issue is, as you just said, is that actually what the, if that, for example, was their first introduction to Slackware? Well, basically, yeah, they say it's Slackware because Slackware ARM is a port. It's so similar to it, as you said on the previous podcast. It's almost identical, apart mm-hmm. from the, the to booting into the installer. You know. But other than that, it's the same. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but if that was their first in, introduction to Slackware, it wouldn't be something that I would want. It, the way that they've done the image is not the way that I would have done yeah. that. Yeah. And so it didn't really represent the work that I would do. It doesn't represent my style. It doesn't represent Slack, uh, Patrick's style either because I mean, I've copied his style on all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't represent that. But on the other hand, they could have asked me to come in and say, well, could you make an image for it? And they could have paid me to do it and I would might have done that. So they got this image. Now you could say, the thing is, it's like, well, that's going to happen. It's, I think it, if you look at it the other way around, well, I think it's a good thing because their intent was good they wanted to provide something that people could you know come into their platform and start using it and it shows that they thought slackware is important enough to do it with right because yeah. it didn't come for free someone had to work on this thing and yeah. test it so that's, it. that's i see that as a good thing and i've kind of come to the conclusion i mean like you i've kind of changed my attitude a bit uh, been a bit more relaxed a bit more slack on these ideas mm-hmm. is that you know sometimes i guess that's just the way it is you know if if people install it and they find so install slackware on there and f- find their way into the community uh, it's not a bad thing really it just means maybe their first impressions aren't quite what you would have liked but such is life you know i guess because there's nothing you can really do about it um and if they if they would have wanted me to have done it it would have been work for me to do even mm-hmm. if they paid me or they didn't um but on that one of the other interesting things about the H3, for example, which I don't, I don't think most people don't realize how this actually works. So I, I got the, the Orange Pi running. I got some sort of separate kernel branch I was maintaining for a bit, separate outside of Slackware ARM while I was trying to get it, get it all together. And I, I got the, um, the, the the network driver patch from Fedora. I just ripped it out of the... I S- remember yeah. that. I do remember that. Right, yeah, me too. It was, yeah. it was a bit of work, that was. Uh-huh. So I got that and everything was fine. And then the kernel upgraded the kernel, and it wasn't so fine because they they'd moved the support for the I don't know what it was called the the the, the drive the hardware on there anymore, but they'd moved the support for that particular hardware from one module to another. It had gone from the ST Mac driver to one that I can't remember anymore. But they it's like oh god, so this this isn't working. So I managed to get a new version of the patch by going through Git and just jamming a patch together, and it didn't work very well to be honest it, it kind of hung the net the kernel would crash every now and then once you started transferring loads of data this is like the worst thing that can happen well one of them and it turns out that it's one guy just one guy he doesn't work for orange pie or whatever the company's called he doesn't work for them doesn't work for all winner he's some guy who just wanted to do a network driver as mm-hmm. i remember rightly so i emailed him and said oh you know i'm doing this and that and do you have any idea how why this breaks and he said i don't have an orange pie 
I didn't have an all win anything with all win. I didn't think he had anything with all winner H three. And I said, well, hang on. But I said this company's this company that's selling orange pies is is basically your work is in there. You could ask them for a free one. They gave me one, and he was yeah. like, did they? And I said, yes. Here's the person. Go and ask them to you can get yourself uh-huh. a free piece of hardware so you can actually test the work you're spending time on. Was, you know, it was just this kind of like you know offline conversation with him yeah. because this guy was doing it as far as I could tell at because he just didn't like he just like right network drivers right. or something. And so, so then he, he worked with me a bit and said, can you test this version? I said, yeah, that one works. I'll keep including that until it got to a stage where all that stuff is now upstream. There was a lot of work that went on in the background to make that work. And so, you know, to me, it's really important that you figure out where to spend your time. And that you know, going back to the brand thing is that Blackware is Patrick's thing. He's not, it doesn't work for Red Hat. You could just get a lawyer to go and say, you need to stop using our brand name, please. You yeah. haven't got the rights for that. You know, but that also goes back to to do with respect. We, you know, we've both seen this, and it's not it's not just about a, uh, a company making an image and, and putting it out and things. It's more about the, you know, I've seen it before where someone's gone and taken Slackware Arm and decided to call their project. For example, if he could, they could somebody could have done what you've done with Sarpy and just called it his Slackware. This is Slackware Arm, right? And, and just said oh, it, it does Raspberry Pi. So oh. people have done things like that before where they haven't given it a new name. And that's just not on, really, because if you think about it, that you are taking someone else's brand name and saying, well, and just using it as if it's your own. And I was talking to a, um, a builder about this. When, you know, when they have laborers to do all the aspects of the building work, I was talking to him about how does that work? You know, how does that work for you? And he said it was really hard because these people... They, they kind of come and go. I try to keep a regular team, but, you know, you, that doesn't always work. You know, if they do a really bad job, that could be the end of me. Mm-hmm. And one of the, oh, this is kind of go off topic a bit, but one of the things that I've been thinking about, you know, as we've talked about this in the past, is I've been, as a professional thing, I'm teaching pe- professional services staff that work in the field for, for vendors, actually how to recognize these types of dynamics and situations and actually provide insights about this is what's actually going on. People think this, people expect this from you as a vendor. These, If you say this or do this, it means this thing. Because a lot of people, I suppose you wouldn't really know. If you don't really know much about open source, you don't know who produces it. You don't realize it's just one guy that doesn't even get a piece of hardware that they're developing a network driver for. Mm. You don't know that that's the case. So I kind of, I suppose I can kind of understand well, what I'm really saying is, is that I'm really aware that what I'm doing represents his brand. So I'm quite careful. So I don't think I've said this before, but when I was before, uh, before Arm Slack was the official port of Slackware, and I can't really remember exactly how that came about, but Patrick was looking at Arm Slack and Patrick had looked at it. He looked at the, because he'd taken some of my work from Linux doc tools, that, that big fat monolithic document package, because I built that for, for Arm Slack initially, because there was no... Um, I needed the document stuff, and it's a bit of a long story that one. Maybe we'll talk uh-huh. about it time, because um, you want to talk about packaging as well, don't you? At some point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but anyway, so he was he ended up looking at the Arm Slack source tree, and one of the things that he said in in my build scripts, why is there a whole load of checks that look for dependencies? So he looked at that, and his initial thought was, as I remember, was something. Well, like, are you adding in dependency dependencies? Tracks? Slack, yeah. This isn't Slackware. I said, no, it's not. These are build time dependencies. They're just simply when you run the script, because of the way I built Armslack, I built it from the ground up as a sysadmin to make things reproducible. So I never had to think about very much of this stuff yeah. again. So I'd gone and may have written scripts to figure out what some of the dependencies were and list them all so that when my system goes to build a package, it makes sure that the dependencies are installed on the system so it actually builds and runs. So that's what that did, I told him. And he goes, oh, okay, fair enough. And so you know, when you look at, because you asked me this before, didn't you? You were, you were concerned about deviating from, yes. like in terms of U-boot and whatnot. One of the things, if you look at the Slackware ARM build script, what's that got to do with the way Slackware does it? The, the build scripts are quite different. The, the, I mean, the, they're broadly the same. I mean, the, 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 all the config options are basically same and all that sort of stuff. But the style and the way that you run the build scripts is not the way that they're running Slackware x86. Okay. Mm-hmm. Have you not looked? Have you, have you actually? <clears throat> ah. Honestly, no. If you want to talk about Slackware x86 build scripts, I've never. I might have looked at a few to compare them with your work, 
but for that reason only. I have looked at the arm scripts many, many times, but not ah. as familiar with the with the with the Slackware x86 stuff. Um, oh, okay. Well, okay. So if you looked at the arm build script, so you'll see that. So in there, there's a directory called arm, and then there's a build script. There's a script called build. Mm -hmm. So that script is the one that has the dependency listing in it and a few other things, and just some, mm -hmm. some sort of setup and things. Yeah. And um, and then you have the other script, the Slack build script which the way that I've done the build system is that it calls out to a library of functions. So, for example, just running mate package is abstracted away into a separate library. All of the setting of the Slackware standards, all of this, you know, the, the ownerships, the permissions, the gzip, man pages, all that stuff is completely abstracted into a library nice. for maintainability reasons. So the way Patrick does is it isn't. It's all the same code is included in all of the Slack builds. So the, the, the x86 Slack builds are basically the same ones as you find on slackbuilds.org, pretty much. They're almost mm -hmm. identical. So, whereas mine aren't, so mine need to call the library because it's easier for me to do it that way. If I want to change the way that we set the ownerships, I do it in one place alone, not all of the build scripts. So anyway, so what I'm saying is, is that the way that I've done that is completely different to how Slackware is. The, however, the results, the actual distribution that you run and the packages, everything about it is all the same. Just the build system is different because it yeah. happens to suit my, my needs. The reason I say that is because that has been that dialogue and, you know, the C's like, okay, well, I've looked at it and I have happy with that. And you just, you know, that, that's what it is. But if you just take someone else's brand and just take and just go and say, well, this is this and Slackware is now on the Raspberry Pi and it, that's it. It's not that it's, it has to be a different name, which is why, you know, you have forks like Salix or Salix or whatever it's pronounced. Yeah. That is a fork, isn't it? And everyone's okay with that because it's based on Slackware. So that's great. If you want to go that way and go and have a look at how it works. But it, there is that distinction. That's the way I um, the way I look at it. That's my yeah. my sorry. While you're talking, my mind you must have a crystal ball because we this is the first time we spoke today, or for a few days in fact, mm -hmm. and I had almost the same conversation with someone earlier this morning about why I follow. Slackware as closely as I do, mm -hmm. and why the the official software cannot be polluted. And I use those exact words specifically because I see what I'm doing as a, not definite pollution, but a risk of pollution. Um, because if I deviate from from what is Slackware. And, and you've already mentioned what if somebody comes along and, and takes my work and, and, and improves on it or, or just adds to it. It's, a, it's like a game of Chinese whispers where at the end of the line, you end up with something completely different than what you started with. So that, that is the right. reason why I try and maintain absolute accuracy within, within the Slackware arm that I'm dealing with. It's funny because many of the things you've mentioned we, we discussed earlier this morning, but with with somebody completely different, and it's just a bit <laughs> surreal. But, yeah, the devices, uh, it doesn't really matter which devices you're dealing with, whether it's the Raspberry Pi, um, Shiva plug, or, or or anything. I mean, it's, it's just Slackware, and it, it needs to be Slackware. It can't mm -hmm. be... Yeah, exactly. Exactly the same things go on in different domains. So specifically is that if you, let's say you're a big company, a well-known, you, know, you pick any brand you like in your mind. And let's say that you want to go and open a new office in a, in a new location, in a new country. What they do, that, that's just, just pick a brand. Let's say that it's Google. Just, I'm just making it up, right? But let's say it's Google because everyone's heard of them and everyone knows they're massive. If they wanted to go and open a new an office in some new country, let's say it's uh, Venezuela, they want to go and open a new uh, office in there. What they do is they go and take the senior, some of the senior people that they need to actually to, to, to get that thing off the ground, that office off the ground. So there's a few things. Well, first of all, they obviously need to check there's, a, there's enough customers in that location. So let's say they've done that. The second thing they need to do is they, they need to go and find out if some of the key people inside there who are senior enough and tenured enough 
are willing to relocate to that location either permanently or long enough, say a couple of years or something like that, to get that office off the ground. And why? Because if they don't, they go and say, what, they're going to just hire random people off the street in? Because what's that going to do? They're going to everybody who comes in is going to come in with their own experience because they're going to hire senior people. You can't hire juniors. So uh-huh. they bring senior people in who have got experience and who only knows where, probably experience within that particular culture and everything else. And so basically, it wouldn't be a Venice, it wouldn't be Google Venezuela, it would be Venezuela Google. The way that they run the company or the way that they represent Google would be the way that they just happen to know how to do it for any other customer. Whereas if they go and take the senior people who already know how Google works and learn, they know how to how to act on behalf of Google in front of the customers. They know what to say, what not to say. They know how to mm-hmm. handle competition when they get in competitive business situations. All that, everything, the way their whole demeanor. That stuff is so important to a brand that that's why they pay a lot of money to put senior people and pay for everything the houses the transport the kids school they find bloody everything is taken care of yeah. because it's that important and then they they hire new people who are fresh and train them into the modeling they mold them as much as you ever can into the style of, of uh, in this example google to make because of that exact reason because it's that important that consistency is there which actually is one of the things i forgot to mention on the first um I think I, I don't remember if I said it or not, but that's one of the reasons why I also like Slackware because even through the years, it's pretty damn consistent. Yes, the yeah. user experience is one of the most one of the things I really like about it is just that user experience consistency. Um, but yeah, I find that. Uh, but those things exist in so many different domains. These exact say, you know, whether it's a builder, whether it's a big multinational vendor, whether it's an open source project, it, it, it's all mm. the same thing. Really, it exists everywhere. Have you got any different kind of views? I was thinking about your original question, what the, 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 the perception of the end user with regards to your responsibility mm. for the software that you've produced. There has been a few occasions where people have come to me and said, look, this doesn't work. And when we've boiled it down, there's nothing wrong with, with the, the SAPI installer. There's nothing wrong with Slackware Arm. It's some other element that they've included which has caused the problem. And that has happened more often than than any other problem that, that I've created has popped up. So, right. um, yeah, the, the software development is, uh, it can be tricky and, and perception is 99% of everything, as I always say. So yeah, what the end user sees you being responsible for, they will hold you responsible for, whether you are responsible for it or not. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a yeah. pretty, that's a good summary. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely the case. The way that you're doing SAPI, it's an extension, the way I look at it, and it's an extension to uh, the Slackware ARM port. And so a lot of what you're doing, it doesn't need to come back to me. Some of it does, though, doesn't it? There's some yes. parts where I've just updated certain scripts because it's easier mm. and you know, to, to look for certain you know, devices and check to make sure that there's a real-time clock or whatever. So a few other things in there. But in the main... But chiefly, much of what you do is self-contained, right? So you yes. don't need to, right? But so here's the, the interesting thing as well is that if you if you need to send something back to the author because you've made you've made an improvement on it, whether it's a document, whether it's a script, or whatever it is, if anyone in the community is going to do that, what they need to do is is have an idea in mind of where they want to go. So you, let's say you want to you want you want to ch- add a feature in or something like that, but the feature is going to take a bit of code. It's not just like one line. The way that you introduce it, you don't introduce it all at one go. So in other words, you don't send the author a hundred line or 50 line, even a, you just don't send an enormous diff. So here's the example. Somebody in the community started sending me patches to the Slackware ARM build scripts so that they could do some of their own thing with it. And the patches were actually, they're adding support for 64 bits. So there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. Uh, they looked all right. But after a while, some of the patches were a little bit more. Like they, they kind of looked at what I'd done and went, oh, I could rewrite this in this way, which, yeah, you could. But that means that I don't know you. I don't know if you've really tested this. Yeah. So am I going to go and then just test building glibc again or OpenSSL just because you've added it, you've changed my the way I've done it? I'm not going to do that because 
it's all very nice that you want to submit. I'm happy. It's, it's a good thing. But on the other hand, someone's still going to have to check whether it's good code or not, whether you've tested yeah. it because you're unknown. So if you're going to send fixes, you need to send them to the developer. First of all, you need know, to find out, shall I send this? Are you interested in it before you do too much? And then start sending it in little drips and drabs because it's a lot easier to understand a very small diff. But actually, it's not just it's understanding. It's easier for a maintainer. It's not that they're not interested in what you're doing. It's just that they don't need that. Yeah. Because if they would, they would have built it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that they, it's not, but they think, oh, okay, what you're doing is good, actually. It's a good addition to the project, but I don't need it. So you, they don't want to spend ages trying to understand what you've written and how it relates to the code. Because usually you know, it's not just a case if you put in a bit of code and that's it. Usually there's lots of other bits around the code that need to change in order to support the in, in order to support that feature. You might need to start adding it, and suddenly that's when the code can be get if, if the code's fragile at all. You know, meaning that you change one thing and it's not there's not there's not a lot of tests. <laughs> yeah, it breaks, right? And sometimes it's okay, but then eventually it breaks anyway in in ways that you wouldn't if necessarily expect. Thank you. Yeah package tools in Slack Pro and ARM are so slow because of the way that the doint scripts run. When it creates a sim link, of which there could be hundreds and hundreds of sim link in one package alone, the way that it works is that actually CDs in the changes directory then makes a sim link. The sim link creation code yes. is all in brackets, which means that the shell executes another bash. A subshell. Yeah, it forks a bash shell and then it execs ln over it. So Jim looked at that. He's like, well, we can... All it's really doing, it's doing CD into this directory, and then it's doing LN. But we, why don't we just use Bash's built-in features? Push D or pop D. We don't need to open a subshell for any of this. Oh, so nice. basically, he wrote a list. He wrote a regular expression that just the, all of the packages in Slackware Arm are the same. They they have the same symlink creation code as x86 does. But in package tools, it actually is piped into a regular expression that turns it into push D and pop D, and then so much faster. And so that's been in there for years. And then eventually, you know, because it's been tested for so long, I said when Patrick was working on patch, uh, package tools for a bit, I said, you just want to put this in. It's a lot faster. It's been tested for like 15 years. So it's gone in there and it works fine. Yeah. So for the, when you've got things like that, you have to be very careful. In his case, because you could ruin someone's system. Yeah. It would be a lever with a really bad user experience. So there's a lot of testing that goes on behind the scenes that people never really know about. You will remember because you were involved in this, do you remember the user that had a problem with the SAP installer wrongly identifying his root partition? It was because one of the scripts expected the root partition to be MMC BLK 0 P5 or 4 or 3 or 2 or 1. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do remember that, yeah. And if it wasn't one of those, it threw a wobbly. So I had to rewrite the whole process. But in doing so, you mentioned a command and you said, well, look into this command because it does this, that and the other. And I thought, OK, I'll look into this. And initially, when I looked at it, I looked at it from the wrong angle. So I'm thinking I'm, I really don't know what Moses is talking about because I can't work out what he means. And then I had another conversation with you. And, and you explained what you meant. And then I went back and, and it just opened my eyes to this, this whole new way of addressing partitions. And, and of course, it got fixed in the end. But yeah, that's that's one one instance that I remember where the SAPI scripts weren't designed as, as robustly as, as what they could have been, but are now in that respect. So I think that's quite an interesting hopefully an interesting insight to how and why people put things out there in the, in the open source community. And certainly everyone's got, you know, what are your reasons for doing what you're doing? Number one, um, I wanted to run Slackware ARM on a Raspberry Pi. And in, in, in doing so, I realized very quickly that I could actually share this with other people and they may enjoy the same benefits as, as what I was enjoying. That's that. That was the the reason behind it all. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, I was just thinking about the the sense of entitlement. It just came back to mind. I was thinking, you know, if people knew why people why other people actually put, went to the effort of making things available and all of the work that's involved in it. You might over time see a shift in the way that people 
talk about these things, the, the way, the, what the kinds of things they write on forums. Because, for example, no one in Slackware apart from Patrick is paid for working mm-hmm. on it. We all just work on it because we like, well, for different reasons, but yeah. it's all voluntary. Even though you've got to put things out there, there's no reason why I have to carry on doing it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Like you don't either. So when I was at Red Hat, 2006, 7, 8, and maybe, maybe yeah, something like that, there, there was this this dynamic where we had lots of younger people coming in who, you know, they worked, they, they'd worked on some projects and they were, you know, because it's difficult, I think, to hire people who didn't, who don't really get what open source is about because mm-hmm. they're not used to using the tools and the, working with the, the actual people in, uh, you know, because... Because if you think about it, Red Hat's really selling free software. Yeah, that's what they're actually doing. Yeah. Um, but eventually, they realised that that's probably not the best long business model to, for long, the long. Doesn't have that much longevity in it because what happens eventually is is that people have other things to do, like mm-hmm. families and other <laughs> various other things come along. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they started hiring people so mm-hmm. that they would have time to actually work on this stuff, so their business could uh, for business continuity. And w- one of the things that that I noticed there was you have some younger people come in and they were still with this sort of like what we used to call the, the hippie mindset. <laughs> you know, everything was really uh, idealistic and we're like, well, welcome to the corporate world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, th- this you're doing things here for a business. Don't expect it to be that you will get to work on all your things and it's all life. And it's wonderful. Mm. There are lots of things here that you need to do because you know the the red hat's name is on it the product an enterprise level product so it needs to meet certain criteria and that you know so there's lots of things that that, yeah i guess even the people that started working i had to make that adjustment to realize that you know i'm actually it's not just me hacking on stuff putting it out there anymore i'm 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 kind of uh, i have to work slightly differently i have to think about things in a different way i don't know i hope that if anyone's going to find that interesting or might might have some disagreements or their own uh, ideas yeah. what um what's your attitude towards say me who comes to you and says okay uh, okay Stuart you haven't got this package and I have done this in the past you haven't got this package and I would like it included for my own selfish personal reasons I mean how do you how do you address that so there are a number of package, a very small number of packages that are in uh, ARM Slack, which are not in Slackware. Uh-huh. So some of them would be, I mean, some of them, they have to be there. Actually, you know what, actually, I think pretty much all of them have to be there. There's one like, uh, there's U-Boot tools for, um, for which you've got MK image and some other stuff to make U-Boot um, images. Yeah. Although I don't think that's needed anymore, actually, because most of the U-boots can boot. They can, uh, they don't need U-bootified versions. But so there's that in there. There's V-boot tools for the Chromebook. There's some other. There's MTD utils for managing like SD cards and um, yeah, the, the NAND devices. You know, the dev, yeah. the MTD block stuff. Yeah. So there's that's in there because you know you need that for ARM. And there's probably a couple of other things. And I think I added some stuff in extra that I needed, like Kpart X. I added that into extra because I needed it for oh, my um, for some of my build scripts, actually. Yeah. So I just put it in there. And so there's a few other things. But those are really only in there because, because they're actually needed by the operating system. Yeah. They're needed by the user to order my scripts or whatever. There's not much in there that I, I don't. So here's the thing, I, because it's a Slackware port, I don't, I, I mean, I could go and add extra things in. Occasionally I do to make my life easy, but it's very, very rare that I add anything in because then it's it's starting to walk away, it's starting to become a fork of of Slackware. Yes. Yeah. So that, then it's not a port anymore. It's a yeah. fork. It's my spin on it. So I take a little liberty here and there, but not usually. I just keep them separately. So in the case of, to kind of answer your question, it depends, right? So there's there's that dimension, and then the other one is well, okay, that's all very well and good, but who's going to maintain that package then? So there's this website called Linux Mafia. Uh, I don't know if you'd ever heard of it, but it, it's been dead for years. And yeah. one of the things that they did was they provided binary versions of packages for Slackware. So it sounds like a nice idea. So it's, it's like Slack builds, apart from it was already built. And so it's a nice idea. It was a nice community project, but there's one problem with this. For released versions of Slackware, yeah, it's probably all right, actually. In some respects, it's OK. I won't get, I don't want to get into too much about that. But mm-hmm. in terms of respects, it's OK. But for current, why is it not OK? 
Why should it be any different for current? Because, okay, so here's one of the things that's that's really important. So let's say you look at the change log, and you, if you look at the change log, uh, you'll see for whether it's ARM or x86, you'll see blah blah, you know, blah 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 rebuilt, blah 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 rebuilt. Yeah. And Patrick yeah. often he didn't used to, but he started doing it now, saying it's rebuilt because of this image manager major version upgrade, major s uh, major shared object version upgrade. I've, so therefore, I had to rebuild all these other things because otherwise they simply wouldn't work anymore. The, the library right. dependency would be broken because the file's simply gone off the file system. So you have to go and rebuild all those things. So that means that if you, inst it's, it's not just for third party packages, but it's also for your own. So if, if users are following dash current and they've built their own packages and they're linking against, let's say, image manager, uh, image manager, sorry, let's say image magic, um, or Libbean PNG or something, whatever, if their package links against it, they're going to have to rebuild that package for themselves. Where And if it's a third party package, somebody is going to have to constantly update that package every time the Slackware current world evolves. Every so I call this technical continuity, right? So you have to, it's something I have to do for customer uh, in my professional career as well, is if the customers change you know, let's say we decommission an API endpoint, which you could say is, is is upgrading image manager. You know, the API is gone or it's changed. Suddenly, all these other tools, the customer may need to now go and change some code to speak to a new version of the API, which could be on a different host name. It could be a different, the API itself could look you know, uh, the, the, um, semantically different. It could, you know, the, the way you interact with it is different. It could have rate limiting, whatever. whatever. All of that, you have to have someone who's like the architect to go and go, okay, well, this world around me is changing. I need to go and I need to go and change a whole bunch of other things to keep to keep in, in lockstep with it. So you'd have to get people rebuilding packages constantly for Dash Current, which is why providing binary packages for Dash Current would be an absolute nightmare, which is why going back to your question, it would mean that every time that uh, if your package depended on something in Slackware ARM, I would have to then rebuild the, that package on your behalf. Right. And not only that, I would have to go and check maybe I, who, who would own the who would own the upgrading of that package, who would own the maintenance of it. So all the ones that, that I've added in for Slackware ARM, it's me. I go in and just see if there's a new version of whatever and I just, you know, package it up. But it also, it takes time for U-Boot. Sometimes they, they changed U-Boot and my build script didn't work anymore. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what have you done? <laughs> okay, so now I've got to go and change my build script yeah. just because you've changed U-Boot source. Yeah. Right, so it's work for me. And and I think this is the thing. I don't think, I really don't think, because most people don't, how many people, you know, I, I remember when I was, I might have said this before, actually, um, I don't remember, but when I met some of the Debian guys many years ago, one of them said to me, so what, so you think, is it just Patrick Volkading really do Patrick Slackware by himself? And I was like, yeah, basically. They were like, how does he do that? <laughs> That's amazing. How can one person manage it, you know, how can they do an entire distribution? How do they know how to do that? I mean, Debian had a lot more packages even back then, but nonetheless, it is, I don't think most most people don't do that. They don't well, maintain. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, on, mm. I'm, not being, I'm, I'm not being flippant, but the only person who can answer that question is Patrick, because he, he's <laughs> the one doing it, you know. Um, exactly. Other people may be interested. In, in how he achieves what he achieves for whatever reason, but um, I, th I think it's outstanding. You know, it's a, it's outstanding what he does, uh, however he does it, um, because I'm not informed in any way on, on subject whatsoever, but the results are, are, out, are, are astonishing. I mean, the Slackware is, is wonderful. It's It's... It's it's so powerful and, and stable and reliable. And to think that one guy is responsible for all this and not a team of 100, you know, it, it is really quite an achievement. Mm -hmm. So even though there is, there is a, a team of the development team around it, various ideas about how to, you know, to upgrade this, upgrade that, Patrick's still the one that reviews it. Yeah. And, and figures out whether it's a good idea or not. Yeah. And so... That, you know that really takes a lot of time and I couldn't do that there's no way that you could, I could ever do that without with actually having a job at the same time it's, it's physically it's just impossible mm. 
the amount of time because it really you no know, i think a lot my impression is that a lot of people think you just you know just run configure and build make install and if a lot of them because you look at the build scripts and that's what it does right <laughs> it's, it's not that easy <laughs> no. i wish it was that easy no i mean you, you know the 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 you mean you should i mean for example just the the only i mean i don't maintain many packages in slackware some of them i added in years ago but i don't maintain them anymore they're really basic things like tape you know mt tape driver and whatnot because i had a I had a tape driver in, in my slackware box at red hat that oh. i was backing they had a spare tape drive so i was just playing around with it i thought well let's get the let's get why the not? package in slackware why not yeah yeah so but that's but the, for example linux doc tools has got tons of packages or tons so Linux doc tools has got maybe, I don't know how many, maybe 10 or something like that, maybe more set what would be separate packages in there. And so that, you know, that build script took hours. It took so long to build, to, to actually test it. And actually, it's really funny because I actually did it when I was working at Red Hat. <laughs> I actually got a spare laptop from the from the store and just reinstalled it over and over to get to get this build and just develop this build script for all these packages for, for, um, for Arm Slack and then put it in in slackware so it took absolutely ages but you know you never see that you only ever see the result and it looks so straightforward oh yeah you run this in this order and that's that but getting to that order is is not necessarily is is, is never seen and so mm. yeah it, it is a lot of work I, I don't know how he does it i certainly mm. could that thing in my head would explode <laughs> so why why is linux doc tools why why is it a, a, a big box of separate packages yeah let's talk about that on the um on the next podcast because you want to talk about packaging as well don't uh, you yeah so i can we can start with that one there is a there is a reason for it like that so let's let's call this podcast a day then and that's uh, the end of podcast episode four so bye-bye from me and it's bye-bye from me thank you very much goodbye <laughs> let's stop recording